The Entrepreneur's Library, episode 246. Welcome to the Entrepreneur's Library, the only book-centric podcast that reviews all the top-selling business books and shares authors' perspective firsthand. This is your resource to finding the next great book that will enable you to grow personally and professionally. Welcome your host, Wade Danielson. Welcome back to the EL. Today we have Steve Blank, author of The Four Steps to Epiphany, Successful Strategies for Products That Win. Welcome, Steve, and thank you for joining us on the Entrepreneur's Library. Thanks for having me. Will you take just a moment uh, before we take a step into your book, The Four Steps to Epiphany, to take a second to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about you personally. Sure. Um, You know, I've uh, been an eight-time serial entrepreneur. I I did eight startups in a series of uh, ever-increasing roles, uh, from kind of spear carrier, uh, head of training and education, uh, training manager, product marketeer, VP of marketing, CEO, uh, and everything from uh, two semiconductor companies, supercomputer companies, video games, enterprise software. And then after I retired, became an educator and started teaching at Berkeley in the business school, Stanford in the engineering school, and now at Columbia and NYU as well. Hmm. And uh, I wrote a series of books about entrepreneurship. So, so Steve, we'll mention some of those other ones at the end, but for now, let's jump into this one that we're going to be discussing today, the four steps to epiphany, successful strategies for products that win, which was originally, I guess, developed back in 2000, we'll say. And, and Steve, we're going to move quickly here today, but the whole goal is to help the, the listener, the future reader, get a great idea of what your book is all about. And so we do that with a series of questions. The first one is, what was the inspiration behind writing the four steps to epiphany? Well, the inspiration around four steps was uh, when I retired, I thought what the world really needed was my memoirs. And so I started writing uh, lessons learned for each of the eight startups uh, I had been in. And I remember I got about 80 pages into the memoir and I realized two things. One is I'd have to even pay my kids to read it, let alone anyone else. But two is, is that there was a pattern emerging from the book and my career that I never even realized existed. And it was about the time I retired, I was not only in eight startups, but I had sat on boards of companies and some boards of three public companies and a whole bunch of uh, non-public companies and advisory boards. And I began to realize what had happened to me was happening to everybody else. And, And that was, and the big idea was, all the common wisdom of how to build and start early stage ventures that was given to us by our investors was simply wrong. Um, Not kind of wrong, but completely wrong. And the advice they had given us was simply, without ever directly saying this, was that startups are nothing more than smaller versions of large companies. That what large companies do, you as a startup should do. And that is large companies, you know, hire sales, marketing, business development, engineering folks on day one. You should do that. Large companies write business plans and do five-year forecasts. You should do that. And more importantly, large companies execute that plan. That is simply staff, hire, build, and ship. And you should do that too. And it turns out that the insight I had was that was completely wrong. Is that large companies have gotten large because they've figured out who their customers are, what their distribution channel was, who their competitors are at a price. And so large companies at their core execute a known business model. All these things are known. But a startup doesn't really know all these things. As a founder, you might believe you know, and your investors are giving you money because they're guessing you know. But the real thing was you weren't executing. Startups were actually searching for business models. And no one had ever called this before. No one had ever said is that premise about startups that we were simply in execution was wrong. And while we had built a hundred years of tools for execution, that is business schools were designed to graduate and, and create masters of business administration. That is people to administer existing companies. And they had built a hundred years of tools and a management stack of tools for a hundred years about execution. No one had spent much time thinking about what, what are the tools for a startup searching for a business model. And so The Four Steps of the Epiphany, I guess in a nutshell, was the first kind of book that 
called BS on the fact that everything we knew about starting and launching uh, new ventures was wrong. And here was an alternative on how to think about it. And at the end, and I'll, I'll go through some more detail later, but at the end, it was the book that kicked off this entire lean startup movement. Mm. So that, in a summary, is, is the, what was behind the book. That's fantastic. And, and this next question, I feel like, is maybe one of the most important because, you know, this isn't the 1937s when Think and Grow Rich came out and barely any competition, any other books came out that year. We're, we're inundated with books coming out on a daily basis. And so I want to give you a, a, an opportunity to separate yours from the rest. What makes your book different from others regarding the same or similar topic? Well, <laughs> it was the first. <laughs> and it is kind of that people have called it the you know, the seminal text, the one book you have to read about entrepreneurship uh, before you read the others. But um, listen, every, every, everything out, else out there is, is quite useful, but brings up the problem you just raised is that if I'm an entrepreneur today, I am inundated with about 10,000 things and um, a lot more than I was when I was an entrepreneur. And, and so I think this book helps you get grounded, meaning it allows you to process everything else you read by helping you understand where are these ideas coming from and, and how are they derived and which ones are important? And, and the things that are important about lean startups and entrepreneurship are some following principles. As I said, and, and I think the biggest one was startups search for what are called business models while companies execute them. But the other key idea was that there are no facts inside your building as you do this search. And again, for a founder, this is kind of a little smack on the side of the head, is while you might be the smartest person in your building, there is no way that you're smarter than the collective intelligence of your potential customers. And, and, and so the book describes something called the customer development process, which is how to get out of the building and actually test everything you believe to be a fact, but actually is just a untested guess or hypothesis. And this methodology is kind of a, a formal way to kind of do this and do it efficiently. Um, and if you follow this path, you end up saving enormous time uh, and money in your company. Um, so uh, I guess the reason to read this, if you'd like to understand how to not waste your time or time of others and how not to waste money and how to Again, because in a startup, survival is all about burn rate. That is, do I have enough cash to continue until I actually find something that's repeatable and scalable? This is the book to start with before you read anything else. Steve, how did you write the book to be read? Is this a book that people can jump in and jump out, cherry picking information? Or did you really design it to be read from front to back? Uh, I read it. I wrote it one word at a very painful time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I know that wasn't your question. I will answer yours in a second. But I have to tell you, it, it was truly one of the hardest things I've ever written because at the time there was zero literature that that said anything like this. In fact, I read everything there was on entrepreneurship in in the year 1999, and everything talked about either how to start a small business or how to write a business plan or, or worse or, or, and or better, how to do entrepreneurship inside large companies. Um, but almost nothing was kind of operationally designed for a startup founder trying to figure out what to do next. There were tactical things like how to write, raise money or maybe how to do a VC pitch. Um, so therefore this book was actually kind of interesting and, every day was kind of a new insight in hacking through the jungle. Specifically, to answer your question, um, the first three chapters are definitely worth reading in one bite because they talk about both the premise of what has become the lean startup, why do it, what's different, you know, how to kind of manage this advice. And then it talks about the first two steps, which is customer discovery and customer validation. And the first one, first step customer discovery is simply how to take your brilliant idea that you have about your company and how to break it down into very simple pieces, which are hypotheses about customers and channel and the rest. And then actually teaches you how to get out of your building and actually start testing whether 
other people other than you share your problem or your view of the need. Just remember implicitly if you're a founder, you believe you're solving a high value problem or fulfilling a need that others have. And one of the mistakes we all make as founders is believing that our passion equals other people's passion. And so step one is ensure that your problem or need is solved, is shared by others. Now step two, which is chapter, which in the book is chapter three, is called customer validation. Assume you've actually tested all these hypotheses and you go, yep, Steve, absolutely found it. Com people completely agree, etc. This is called customer validation. Customer validation is a fancy word for let's get some orders or users or whatever evidence we need as early as possible for buggy, unfinished, or maybe even not even not even delivered software, hardware, or whatever we have before, way before we ever ship the product. And while most people think it's impossible to do, it's in fact quite easy to do if you have found a passionate set of early uh, adopters or internal evangelists in, the, in a company. I call these early evangelists who will gladly pay for early access to a, to a product. And if you can't find any of them, uh, then it's a good signal, maybe not a complete one, but a good one, uh, to say then probably your initial assumptions and discovery might have been wrong. Um, and so these uh, first couple chapters get you started. The other chapters are in the book are about what happens after you actually find what's called product market fit. Um, there's a section called customer creation, which nowadays uh, some people call growth hacking. And then there's a section on company building of what to do when you actually are successful in scale. How do you keep the company having the same um, startup culture as, as it, get, it gets larger? But those chapters I reserve for the phrase, you should be so lucky to have this problem. Uh, but the first couple are immediately readable and immediately actionable. So, Steve, we've already we've already dove in quite a bit. Is there anything else you'd like to have? Because because usually we roll right into the deep dive, and we've covered so much already. Is there anything else that you would like to add uh, before we move on to the next question? As far as uh, anything that you think the the future reader should know uh, before they pick up the book? Well, the other thing about the book is that there's a whole set of checklists and and worksheets in the back of the book that uh, uh, help you figure out what to do step by step. And uh, the book is a good preamble to reading my next book, The Startup Owner's Manual, which truly is a step-by-step -step guide. Uh, this book has uh, uh, the four steps of the epiphany, uh, has a lot more philosophy of why to do it, and the Startup Owner's Manual has almost an encyclopedia of how to do it. But uh, uh, no, I think The Four Steps uh, is probably the first book uh, I would hand a... Uh, a first time or even a second or third time entrepreneur who, who was looking for guidance on why should I just not build my product and ship it? Again, the, the, the problem, the only problem with entrepreneurship today is the cost of entry is so low is that um, most entrepreneurs just simply believe if I build it and, and follow my passion, uh, you know, users or money will follow. Um, and, and it turns out that unless you're randomly lucky, that's almost never the case. Um, it really does require preparation and and uh, uh, some legwork to make that happen. And and it's different legwork than just building the product. Um, and, and that really is a surprise for most entrepreneurs. There really is two tracks to building a company. One is making sure the product or service works, but the other is making sure that all the pieces of commercializing, that is finding, uh, building a business are there. And that's the part that the four steps of the epiphany actually helps entrepreneurs do. So Steve, this is, uh, we're, we're, you, so you've done a great job of breaking down your book and now we're going to ask you to take it even one step further. And that's it. You know, if the reader can only take away one concept, principle or action item out of this entire book, everything you've discussed with us so far from this book, what would you personally want that to be? There are no facts inside your building. So get the hell outside. Will you, will you take just a second to break that down? Sure. What um, it means to you? I, I think as, as I said earlier, um, you know, founders are driven by a passion to bring something inside of them out and share it with others. You know, the problem is, is that passion sometimes convinces you so deeply that you're right 
that a startup becomes a faith-based enterprise, meaning a religious activity. Uh, yet, um, you know, it, it might be in God we trust, but everybody else needs to pay cash. I mean, meaning while you might believe, uh, the odds of that being true are, are not very high. We kind of know that while most founders think they're visionaries, the data says 98% of them are hallucinating. Mm. And, and so now the question is, how do we actually turn a faith-based enterprise into facts? And the point is, the facts about who are the customers, what's the channel, you know, what's the right pricing model that is subscription, direct sale, you know, uh, uh, license, something else. Uh, what kind of partners do I need? What are my costs? Well, you could make a great guess about all those things sitting inside a room. The odds are it, it, it's almost impossible to nail all of those on day one. The second reason to get out of the building and to have the, the founders do it, not a VP of sales, not a proxy, not someone else, is that most often is when you find out that your initial hypotheses are incorrect. In the old days, what we used to find this out way after first customer ship, we find out our you know, product isn't selling. So what would we do? We'd fire the VP of sales, replace the new VP of sales who would say, hey, that was a really stupid idea and we ought to be selling over here. And then that would go on for months or years and numbers still wouldn't be looking good. Then we fire the VP of marketing because obviously it's a positioning problem, not a sales problem. Then eventually we fire the founder, the CEO, and you know bring in someone else because clearly it wasn't poorly managed. Never once would we think, never once would we ever say, perhaps the plan was wrong. The whole customer development process, in fact, gets us out early to see if we want to fire parts of the plan. And this really is kind of a neat idea, is that getting out of the building allows us to do something called the pivot. And a pivot is defined as a substantive change to one or more of the business model canvas components. Then what's a canvas component? Who the customer is. You might get out early and discover, well, your product is wonderful. It actually should be, be sold to urban youth rather than moms in the Midwest. Or you might discover that, you know, you got the right target market. It's, you know, like adults, you know, 18 to 35 but they only care about features 3, 7, and 12. And all the other stuff you're building is just going to be waste. So why don't you just focus on that? Well, number one is you'll never know that sitting in your office or, or building. And number two is only the founders can make pivot decisions, not some proxy, not someone else. And so I call this firing the plan uh, rather than firing the people first. Ultimately, you might decide you have the wrong people in the organization, but almost always, the, some of your assumptions about the plan are just fundamentally incorrect. So we could turn a faith-based organization into a fact-based organization fairly rapidly. So, Steve, I think that was, uh, you know, our next question is usually, do you have a favorite quote from your book? And that was obviously a quote right there in itself and a great explanation. But, but I'll ask anyway, do you have a, a quote, something that you wrote that has really resonated with the audience? And we take a second to explain what it means to you. Yeah, I, I, I think the there are no facts inside the building and get the heck out um, kind of is right up there. Probably the other one is, you know, let's fire the plan before we fire the people. Um, and the pivot allows us to do this or are, are, are kind of the two that is the takeaway um, uh, from the book. The other, as I mentioned earlier, probably the third idea is startup search, large companies execute. Um, and this is kind of the manual on how to search for a business model. That's fantastic. And Steve, we're going to step away from, so, so first of all, we're going to put all of the, the quotes and the content in the show notes at the elpodcast.com. Our audience of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs are, are uh, extremely mobile, even compared to the normal, the normal podcast listeners. So we'll put that in the show notes. But th this next one, we're going to step away from your book and we're going to ask you for not any recommendation. We're asking you for the book recommendation. There's no rules on this. It, it can be for entrepreneurs or not. It can be nonfiction, fiction. It does not matter. But what is the one book you would recommend based on the way that it's impacted your life, maybe created a lifestyle or a paradigm shift? You know, Alexander Osterwalder's Business Model Generation book um, is right up there with Eric, Lisa, Eric Reese's Lean Startup book. But I would say the Osterwalder book uh, simply because um, I use the word business model a lot. 
but Osterwalder kind of defines it in one picture. His book is mostly pictures, um, which is much more readable for me. Um, and I think for a good number of the entrepreneurs, you hear the phrase business model, but here it is right in front of you. And in fact, his book became one third of what became the lean startup. Alexander Osterwalder's business model canvas, which comes out of his book, my customer development process, which is the four steps of the epiphany, and then Eric Reese's observation about agile engineering, which, which was in his book, The Lean Startup, those three components, business model canvas, customer development, and agile engineering to build minimum viable products, make up this buzzword you hear called the lean startup. So if I had to have anything on my shelf, I would have those three books, you know, My Four Steps to the Epiphany, probably read first, Osterwalder's Business Model Generation, and then Eric's Lean Startup. And that's about all you need to read to kind of get this whole kind of lean startup movement. That's awesome. What a, what a fantastic takeaway. And, uh, and I know that uh, I will be ordering. What, what, will you tell me his name one more time? Alexander. Alexander. And the last name is O S T E R. W-A-L-D-E-R, Osterwalder. And the book is called Business Model Generation. Yeah, that's fantastic. I can't wait to order and dive into that one. So Steve, before we depart, can you recommend the best way for our listeners to not only get more information on you, but also to gather some more information on your book, The Four Steps to Epiphany, and, and your other books? Sure. So uh, probably the best source of all this stuff is I have a website for entrepreneurs called, of all things, steveblank.com. <laughs> And you could find uh, on the right-hand side just links to Four Steps to the Epiphany and the Startup Owner's Manual and uh, other things I've written. You'll see on tabs on the top, it's particularly of interest to founders, a, a tab called Startup Tools. Every tool a startup uh, might need to use is listed there. And then I write um, essays about uh, a couple times a month on entrepreneurship and if you have a particular category you're interested in, the categories are listed on the left. Uh, so complete, oh, and also slides and videos of everything I open source are under the tab on the top, slides and video. So anything an entrepreneur or founder or, um, or somebody considering founding a company wants to know about entrepreneurship is on that side. Excellent, Steve. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your book with us today. Great. Thank you for having me. Thanks again for listening in today. If you'd like more information on Steve or his book, The Four Steps to Epiphany, check out the show notes at the elpodcast.com. Looking for your next book idea? Head over to the elpodcast.com, where Wade shares his amazing resource, the top 10 business books recommended by over 500 entrepreneurs with you for free. That's the elpodcast.com. Till the next time, keep it on the EL.